I'd like to call the meeting to order. If we can say the same question, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We uh, have no written communication. Can we have any board or committee updates, meetings since the last meeting? All right. I guess, and we have we have no visitors in this week. We can move right into the superintendent's report. Well, thank you. Um, I'm pleased to welcome members from Turner Construction and uh, Newly Gray Architectural, as well as uh, our director of facilities, Mark Rampato, and Mrs. Bozinski here to talk about uh, phase three of our capital construction project, which we just had the pleasure of viewing firsthand. So welcome. Can I able to take this off? Yes. Yeah. For noise, or so I'm loud enough. All right. So, is it possible to dim the lights? Maybe so you can see this color. Yeah, that'd be a great one. Okay. Okay. All right. Awesome. Just want to make sure you can see what it looks like before. Um, so, just a little background. We began work on February 28th disassembling the serving line that was currently in the um, cafeteria and kitchen space. And we created the temporary kitchen over in the South Gym area. So we'd really like to thank the um, high school staff and Jeff for working with us to get into that space ahead of time and give us as much time as possible to work within the kitchen and cafeteria. Um, there was an extreme amount of asbestos and abatement removal and just the time frame alone for that um, activity was about two and a half months. So that alone, getting it as soon as February helped us incredibly. So um, we started on February 28th and by March 16th, the school closed and we were able to go full force with um, additional workers who had, got, who had been shut down from other projects. So it actually was a win-win for us. Um, in that sense. So it helped there. Later on, it was a little bit difficult with some of the manpower, um, getting materials on site, but the initial startup was a great place to be. Um, so this view right here is where, when we walked into the cafeteria earlier, the wood slat ceiling is now here, like you can see. Um, so the kids were eating in a space where ceiling tile had fallen, there were exposed piping, things of that sort, and to bring them into a space like this. Um, I'm really excited to see everybody on Thursday. So um, we had um, intricate wood ceilings that concealed all the exposed piping that you can see there. All of that is now accessible, so um, if the maintenance staff needs to get in there, they have no problem doing so, and we'll have labels and things of that sort so they can service it. Um, the space, as you can see, is more developed and um, spaced out so that it can be used for, um, I know there's a cafe space over here, Tony was talking about using the other space on the other side for maybe board meetings or classrooms, small instruction. So the way it was now laid out has really developed a space that I think is a lot more usable than the original. Um, so this is just another view. Um, let me see. As you can see, in, over on the left-hand side, a lot of the, you can see the old windows there, and on the right, how much more light is now able to come into that space. Um, in addition to that, a lot of the changes in um, height will help with the noise. So the ceiling, um, the ceiling acoustics will help create smaller intimate spaces where you're not going to hear as much noise travel from one space to the next. Um, and then in addition to that, there was additional HVAC and fresh air that we were feeling while in the space earlier. So all of that will um, really translate especially into the space here. 
So this is a view of the serving line on the left. So before students would enter in the center, split off, and um, there was a small salad bar. I know they had some warm trays, um, some pizza stations. The new serving line has additional, um, there's hot bar, cold bar, grab and go, um, pizza station, sandwich station, and it's easy to be able to um, modify the use of this as well. So um, I know the designer worked really hard with the um, old kitchen manager and as well as Tracy when she took over um, just to ensure that this was gonna be a space that they were gonna have future growth and potential with um, to work with you know whatever um, food and things of that sort will come. So this is another view of that serving line. And then over on the right hand side here, we're moving towards the back of the school where that small um, fireplace section is. So there'll be a monitor over here as well as some small chairs. Uh, just another space that was broken up in this new layout. So back in the cap or the kitchen, I don't know how many of you had the opportunity to go back there, but um, the kitchen staff was working in a very confined space. It was um, extremely narrow and not a lot of room to move things about. So with the new layout, they extended out probably about 15 feet further. It did become shorter, but it created an open space um, that will give them a lot better feel for just uh, movement throughout the um, kitchen. Um, only two pieces of equipment were reused which were new. Um, so really the new space has all brand new tables. Um, the appliances are all brand new as well. And then uh, I know that right now they're moving in and trying to figure out exactly what they're going to keep and what they're going to get rid of. But um, we've had really great feedback from the kitchen staff just saying that they have so much, in, so much more than they ever thought they needed. And so I guess that's a good place to be in. Uh, this is another view of the hood. So on the left is the original, on the right is the new. So very similar. Um, the technology doesn't change too much, but the equipment is brand new, it's clean. Um, the an added benefit is this floor trough, which will be used for the kettle. So that's a direct dump of all the water right into there. Um, and then on top of that, uh, additional lighting for that space. Now the um, basement corridor here, this is where the art and home ec rooms are. So on the left hand side, um, you can see just the brown old flooring. Um, it was about two inches thick that we had to remove in that would also contain asbestos. So um, between that and then within the classrooms, the floor continued and there was um, abatement of the ceiling, the plaster ceiling as well. Uh, luckily, this corridor had been done on a previous project, which helped us save some time on the schedule. Um, so on the right shows some of the progress. As you saw as you walked through the space today, that's been cleaned up even more so with paint and ceiling tiles. Um, the bookstore, that space will get wrapped up shortly. Um, sometimes we have to prioritize our time in making sure that the space is able for students and um, staff to occupy things like that, taking a little bit to the wayside, but that will get wrapped up very soon. On the left-hand side is the old home ec room. So mismatched furniture, um, old cabinets that were cracked and just abused over time. Uh, the space was really sectioned into one teaching space and then the cooking. Whereas now you'll have tables that will able, you know, the teacher will be able to do um, teaching instruction over near where the kids will be cooking, as well as the other side. So that gives them more versatility there. Um, where this picture is taken is where that demonstration table is. So directly behind it will be a monitor to um, for instructional space. There will be a camera so that um, they can actually show what's being prepared and um, their kids can see from that view as well. 
and then the art room here. Um, this poor space between just how much was in there and all the different flooring, there was tile popping, old trenches that were along the perimeter wall that had um, started popping up over time as there were old steam lines in there that heated up. Um, that was all gutted. The ceiling was removed. Um, the new windows. This is a progress shot. So really this was about a week ago. So you can just see how quickly progress changes in just a week. Um, now there's furniture in that space. There'll be a few cabinets that are uh, placed on, the, or sorry, a countertop that will get placed this week. So all in all, the space will be wrapped up very soon. That's it. Any questions? So, uh, in the handout that you had in front of you, that was taken in probably the beginning of the last week of August, and we walked the space today, so you can see how much has really taken shape over the five days, four days. So, just the, sh the sheer volume that gets put in place uh, you know, towards the whole month. And uh, again, just a beautiful space. I'm really proud of our team, uh, the Knights team as well, and the district. I just want to give kudos to Mark and Kyle and his team as well, and Laura as well, and looking at the district offices, making things happen, and creating hurdles, and allowing the progress to happen and take place smoothly. I thought things went very smoothly this year, considering the fact that we had other places in the pandemic, and we were able to accommodate a lot of things, and we were able to materials to keep them exploring the job. Uh, one of the things that was super important that Brittany mentioned earlier, was being able to be identified as a essential workplace, which we were able to establish immediately, which was great. Um, so um, that just really allowed us to accelerate the schedule. Um, you can tell by the last couple of months, the school districts were kind of catching up. All of a sudden, they said, yeah, let's go. And at that point, it was ready in July. So a lot of the workers started getting stretched. And we were able to really bring it home right before that happened. So uh, I just want to say thanks again to the district also. Uh, and I'll tell you about uh, everything that happened as well. So. Yeah, really significant transformation in that space. Uh, wide open, bright, um, welcoming, warm. So what you don't see is a lot of hard work and long hours behind the scenes. Uh, I can't remember how many planning meetings and hours that go gone into this, but with young and right architects, our teachers who are occupying those spaces, our employees who work in the cafeteria and kitchen, Mark, um, everybody. It's really been a great team effort. Um, and all of the ideas have been captured and, and put into the design, and I think it's turned out uh, better than I expected. Fantastic. Thank Anybody you. have any additional questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wheaton is here to talk about the guidance we received Friday night at 8 o'clock on fall sports for this school year. I actually received it at 7, you received it at 8. <laughs> 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 hey, you don't have a sense of humor for all of this, right? Sometimes it drives my wife crazy. Alright, so... Uh, you all should have a handout that looks like this. This is the presentation that's up on the screen. Uh, nothing flashy. It had to come out uh, to me at 7 o'clock on Friday night. So I spent some time over the weekend deciphering the information. You're going to get 45. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is a 50-page uh, document from the New York State Public High School Athletic Association in relation to the uh, document from the New York State Department of Health titled uh, Sports and Recreation During the COVID-19 Public Health Emergency. So a few goals for tonight. Uh, one, to update you on where we currently stand with athletics. 
two to give you some updates are, uh, regarding to New York State Department of Ed and NISPA, New York State Public High School Athletics. An overview of the guidance documents which we've received so far. And then lastly, um, I'm looking for some guidance, we're looking for some guidance on how we're going to move forward. Um, Section 6 is, has sent out a survey um, with some different scenarios for us to consider. So I'll jump right in. Take my mask off here. All right, so our current status, um, we, we're on hold until at least September 21st. There have been no practices, no captain led practices since the end of last winter season. We've been completely shut down for at least six months now um, from last March. Um, our coaches have done a phenomenal job of connecting with kids. We've asked them to do that. Um, I, I truly believe that they have done that with our kids in many different ways. Uh, this past spring was a testament to that from all the different activities and events that we still did even though we were remote. Uh, fall sports sign-up forms have gone out. They opened up on August, third, uh, August 21st. It's typically 30 days prior to the start of the season. In addition, uh, the parent portal in Aspen is open as well for parent consent forms. So what I'm getting at is we're continuing trying to move forward as much as possible with the information that we have. The APP process, which is the process for 7th and 8th graders to uh, play up at the JV and varsity level, has also been in process. Fitness testing is scheduled for September 14th and 15th. Letters have gone home to parents to uh, request their permission. Letters will be sent home via email tomorrow, uh, allowing those kids to come fitness test on the 14th and 15th. Obviously, social distancing and screening, et cetera, will take place. Sports physicals um, are currently being rescheduled. Those are for students that do not have access to or have not been able to get a sports physical with their, their own PCP, their primary care physician. We will be offering those for our, our students as well. It may look a little different and may be scheduled um, accordingly for social distancing and, and one student obviously in the nurse's office at a time, but we'll make that happen for those students that need that. Um, continuing our coaching staff, we have uh, four new coaches that will be joining Amherst this fall. In addition to some movement within our football program, our, our two JV coaches are anticipated to move up to the varsity level. Uh, we have a varsity fall coaches meeting actually tomorrow to review some of these guidance documents. In addition to section six was planning a meeting tomorrow as well to review the guidance document, give some guidance or some recommendations going forward, which I was told today. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, I don't think it works. It doesn't work. It's been six months you know, since I've had it. <laughs> All right, there we go. Um, section 6 was supposed to meet tomorrow, but I think they're pushing that off till Friday. Again, all of this is still kind of up in the air. Uh, the Booster Club is planning on meeting on September 14th, which is our next meeting to plan for the school year and discuss guidance documents as well. What are we going to do as a Booster Club? Again, we're trying to move forward as much as we can. The ECIC League, which is what we're a part of, um, and all fall coaches will meet tentatively on September 16th, again, to review guidance document and our decision to move forward. And then lastly, we have a tentative parent preseason meeting scheduled for September 18th. Again, all of this information is contingent upon a September 21st start date. So uh, a lot of dates coming up, a lot of information that needs to get disseminated, which we'll be ready to do. Um, but time is of the essence and some decisions need to be made. New York State Ed updates. Um, all of our coaches are first aid CPR, ADD. Trained. Uh, we had a training last week on Super one of the superintendent conference day, so we're all squared away there. The New York State Bonafide student regulation uh, pertains to students that are on remote or hybrid instruction. As long as they're enrolled in three core classes plus physical education, they are eligible for interscholastic athletics. Uh, New York State Trans New York State Ed uh, determined that districts are not required to provide additional transportation. So there was discussion about what do we do for students that are on remote instruction or on hybrid instruction? How do we get them to practices? Uh, New York State Department of Ed stated that it's not up to the district to provide that additional transportation beyond what we typically do for games and contests. And then lastly, 
New York State Department of Ed uh, is allowing physical examinations to be received from the 1819 or accepted from the 1819 school year, 1920 school year, as long as an inter uh, health, uh, interval health history form is submitted from the parent, which is basically a, a questionnaire form within 30 days of the start of the season. So um, some changes took place to, to try to move this forward in the right direction. New York State Public High School athletic updates. Practice requirements have changed. It's typically six practices for uh, all sports but football. That increased to 10 for health and safety reasons. For football, it has increased from 10 to 12. So just something to pay close attention to as, they, as we continue to push the season that closes that window of how much time we have for contests and games. Um, but for health and safety reasons, increase in practices. They waived the seven day consecutive rule, um, which basically means that you can practice or play seven days a week, which currently it is six days a week, so with one day rest. Uh, and that will start on October 12th, and the purpose behind that was to be able to get your games and practices in in a shorter uh, season. League and section play uh, held locally within our region. It was stated today from the New York State Public High School Athletics that play should consist uh, of playing uh, competition within your own section. So we shouldn't be going to Syracuse or to Rochester. We're gonna keep it here in Western New York initially until at least October 19th or a later date is, is given. Um, there will be currently no fall uh, or fall regional and state championships. So it's all local play for the fall. The winter and the spring are still up in the air of whether or not those championships will take place. And then lastly from NISFA, Winter sports were pushed back two weeks to November 30th. Again, that's to uh, give additional time for fall sports. Um, one statement from Dr. Zayas, he is the executive director of the New York State Public High School Athletics Association, also called NISPA. Participation in interscholastic athletics is certainly voluntary for both the individuals and the schools. The NISFA recognizes school district superintendents and Board of Education have the authority and autonomy to administer their district's athletic programs as they deem appropriate. So within the guidance that we are given, you all have the autonomy and, and the authority to de deem what we feel is appropriate for our kids and members. Uh, they have outlined sports into three different categories, low risk, moderate risk, and higher risk and that risk is associated with the ability to maintain physical distance, shared equipment, and cleaning and disinfecting of equipment between users. On the screen, you'll see the, the sports that we offer here at Amherst. The ones that are highlighted in yellow are the higher risk sports, which are competitive cheerleading, football, and boys and girls volleyball. To the left are our high school sports, and to the right are our middle school sports that we offer. You can see currently we offer 19 JV and varsity teams uh, in the fall and eight modified teams uh, at the middle school in the fall. So the current guidance document speaks to lower risk and moderate risk sports as being able to participate in practice and competition starting on September 21st. Those higher risk sports that I previously mentioned, football, competitive cheer, and volleyball, uh, currently may, may begin practice but may not take part in competition until further notice up until the uh, uh, drop dead date of December 31st, 2020. I'm going to run through some of the main nuts and bolts of the NISA document. Um, it is online, it, it is on our website, or it will be on our website if you want to see the full document. But I'm just going to run through some of the main things. You'll see themes as we go through these. So, generally speaking, for all participants, uh, obviously things like washing hands, acceptable face coverings, clean and disinfect frequently touched uh, equipment and surfaces, six feet of physical distancing, I've learned to say physical distancing lately because we want kids to be social, right, in athletics and physical education, so the term physical distancing. Um, and then establish a hydration plan for student athletes. Those big water jugs out of the football field just are not gonna work anymore, right? The big water jugs behind the bench in volleyball is not gonna work anymore. So how are we gonna manage that to make sure our kids stay hydrated? Again, you're gonna see similar themes as we go through this. So for student athletes, some main themes or considerations, 
physical distancing, acceptable uh, face coverings, their own workout clothing, uh, mouth guards in the, in the mouth at all times, bring their own water bottle labeled, um, provide their own supplies to the extent possible. And obviously, a you know, $300 football helmet isn't reasonable, um, but a mouth guard would be. Um, shower at home before and after games. These are just some considerations from the NISMA. For coaches, same kind of thing, six feet, cloth, uh, face covering, clear expectations for student athletes and parents so everybody's on the same page. And obviously, no, no contact anyway, hugging, high fives, handshaking, et cetera. For us athletic administrators, there are a number of, of things that we need to go through to make sure that our students, our coaches, our spectators are safe um, at all of these venues. Things like staggered practice times, uh, game times, limit game day rosters, um, that, that plays a part into how many people you may have on the sideline, or how many individuals you're putting on a bus. Um, teams should be equipped with their own medical supplies, their own cleaning, disinfecting supplies, locker room policies to reduce density, um, communicating in advance with all of our officials to make sure that they understand where to go on certain in our facilities. Um, reduce density on the bus, train coaches on proper use of cleaning and disinfecting, which we've already done with our physical education staff as well. Our custodial staff has done a nice job to run through some of those protocols. For spectators, so as it relates to our community members, our parents, um, grandparents, etc., six feet as always, cloth uh, face coverings, disinfecting your athlete's equipment after uh, practice and games. Uh, here's a big one, limiting two spectators per rostered athlete. So again, it's that whole approach to reduce density. So if we're going to have a uh, football game, if we're able to get to that point, it would be two spectators per rostered player. So that's just something that we have to manage and we have to monitor. Um, and then obviously it would follow all school section and league policies. So if we have some specific school district policies, we adhere to those. If there's some specific ones to the section or to our league, we have to adhere to those. Um, the part to that that's very important is because it's not just within our school district, we travel to other school districts, we all have to collaborate together to have very, very similar, if not the same expectations. If I go to Star Point, it needs to be very similar, if not the same. If, if Orchard Park comes to us, it needs to be very similar. And that's where our league and our section needs to get on the same page. For officials, it's basically the same, same kind of deal. Um, one thing to note for officials here is they are responsible for game management. They are not responsible for the social distancing, the PPE, the cleaning and sanitizing. Um, that's a piece, they're, they're responsible for the game management. So that, that piece of athletics will be on athletic administrators, our game management staff, um, and, and those, those workers that we have. Facilities, so Mark Rampato's crew, um, limiting capacity to 50%, six feet of social distancing, waiting lines we saw this past spring with graduation and some other events that we had. They did a really nice job of signage, uh, marking out certain areas where folks can go. I envision the same thing would be for athletics. Um, creating bi-directional foot traffic, one way in, one way out clearly identifying which gate to come in and which gate to leave. Um, and then if we do get to the point where we sell tickets, um, to have them contactless, which we've already partnered with Tickets that hit, which is online tickets that we could use. Um, and it's also a way that we can track who's coming and going and maintaining that two spectators per contest. Um, screening. So daily health screenings, which we already have in place for our kids and our staff across the district. Uh, the piece that comes into play is how about students that are on remote or they're on hybrid and they're not in school day that, that day, we still are required to screen those students in some capacity. Our coaches will need to have a roster of who's on cohort one, cohort two, et cetera, and we'll have to track that accordingly and really do a good job of keeping track of those cohorts of kids for practices and games at all times. All right. Um, sports specific considerations, I am not going to bore you with all of the details of it, it is in the document, but just one example here um, in the sport of cross country, meet should consider using staggered or wave interval starts with a one minute in between. So again, just a sports specific strategy to help uh, reduce density, create space of social or physical distancing, etc. And again, that's all written in this document. That is the piece tomorrow when I meet with our varsity fall coaches that we will go through in detail so that they understand what the expectations are for their specific sport. 
Okay, so what are the next steps with athletics? Um, complete the Section 6 Interscholastic Survey, which you have a copy of, and I'll go through that in a minute. Evaluate the Section 6 decision, which we're expecting um, by the end of the week, and then continue to prepare, educate, inform our, our community, our student-athletes, our spectators, parents, etc., as we attempt to move forward with interscholastic athletics. So a lot to digest. I spent quite a bit of time over the weekend digesting these documents. Um, I think it's a, uh, it, it, you know, at times it's a contentious topic right now in the media and where we're going with athletics. We see a lot going on with, with collegiate athletics. Uh, we know that kids benefit from sports. Um, that, is, that is proven through research. research. Uh, we know it's good for kids, but we also have to be aware and cognizant of health and safety as we're, as we're reopening schools as well. So with that, Section 6 had sent out last night a survey looking for athletic directors, superintendents, board of education to weigh in on um, uh, some of this information. So I'll, I'll just kind of go through it quickly. It's this form right here. There are four different or five different scenarios for us to consider. And just to add, Section 6 is made up of 78 school districts. So they're trying to get information from each district and to get something out as it relates to this guidance that's a little consistent across the section. Um, so they've given us four options and then an all-encompassing other. And uh, Mr. Wheat and I have looked at this and we think we have the, the option that we would put in as our survey response. It's not a vote per se, it's just a survey for them to consider. But we also wanted to make sure that the board was on board before we respond. Okay. So option one would be very similar to what I just presented. A September 21 start date. Our higher risk sports would be allowed to practice. Our low risk and our moderate risk sports would be able to practice and compete in games. Okay. Option two would be, again, to September 21 start date, those lower risk and moderate risk sports would be allowed to participate in practice and contests. Our higher risk sports uh, would not be. Uh, the section would be looking to move those sports to possibly another season. Option three would be to push back the start of the season one week, September 28th, to allow for more time for schools to reopen their buildings and get kids in the building. But it follows the same same strategy as option one, where uh, all sports would start at higher risk, would be practiced only to start the season. Option four, um, again, starting on September 28th, one week later, low risk, moderate risk sports are, are clear to go, with higher risk sports on hold uh, for the time being until a further decision is made to either move the season to the winter or spring. And then lastly, option five, which is, a, which is an other, Right, leaves it open to some interpretation um, from, from my conversations with colleagues uh, within the area, within the section. Option five has been discussed as the potential for uh, moving all three seasons to a condensed season that the NISFA had pr proposed back a month or two ago, which was winter season starting on January 4th, going through to March 13th, fall season starting on March 1st, going through till May 8th, and then the spring season starting on April 5th to June 12th. Again, number five is open, open to interpretation, but from speaking to a handful of my colleagues, that seemed to be um, probably the best suitable option for an other option if we were not going to start this fall. Um, I can tell you that Section 6 is hopeful to start this fall, but they're looking to survey all of their, their member schools. What would be the downfall of the condensed season plan? And you have a handout that outlines that, um, that, that you've been given. Um, so it's more detailed on the back where it has the seasons. What would be the downfall if our section went with the condensed plan but the rest of the state didn't? Right, so the downfall of our section went with the condensed season plan would we would most likely eliminate ourselves from any regional or state championships. For winter, winter and spring. Spring. for winter and spring. We're all, we've already, that's already out of the question for fall. Um, winter and spring regional and state championships are already uh, being planned. 
um, you know, tentatively planned, but we would most likely eliminate ourselves from that opportunity. Um, one of the positives of a condensing season, given that we're back to both normal by that time, is every team would have an opportunity to play. The risk we take in the fall a little bit here is if we get started and, you know, we, you know, God forbid, we, we have to shut down remotely, that season may get either pushed or go away entirely. Um, so there's a little bit of risk there on, you know, on what our decision is. Well, it seems like the other issue, though, is uh, let's just say you're a three-sport athlete, you have to pick a sport. Or if you're a two-sport athlete, you have to pick a sport. Right. Yeah, so there's overlap. If you look at the, the schedule of the proposed uh, condensed season, there is overlap. So to your point, um, student athletes may have to pick one or two sports with that, with that being said, whereas our current model, if we, if we were to take place in the fall, we would try to keep our, our system the same where you could play two and three sports and not have an issue with it. Uh, we also do have many two and three sport coaches as well. Uh, I can think of many coaches on our, on our football staff that coach lacrosse. Uh, Mr. Kenzie is one, one that just comes to mind right now here at Kenzie. Coaches football and lacrosse that might run into an issue if, say, the football season moves to the spring. So, you know, there's, there's a number of factors. It's not going to be perfect. At the end of the day, we're trying to provide as many opportunities for kids to be active, for them to participate, to have, you know, the, the, the most, uh, you know, beneficial high school experience as possible. It's going to look different, but we know that this, this year's never end. Well, the reason I was mentioning the time that I received the guidance on Friday was in, uh, as a compliment to Mr. Wheaton, because we expected it around 1 o'clock Friday, and it was delayed. And in anticipation of it coming out on Friday, we had put this on the agenda, because we know it's a topic many people are interested in. And I want to give him credit for uh, the work he pulled together over the long weekend for tonight's meeting in not only reading and deciphering the doc document, but being able to present it to you, all of you. So our um, response that we're recommending for this survey is response three. We think we should move forward with um, competition and play for the low risk and moderate risk, and then allow the high risk to practice. And when we say practice, we're talking about conditioning mostly. You know, football, we don't expect them to be out there scrimmaging each other. That would defeat the purpose, but they might be meeting two or three days a week and doing conditioning work safely and in a socially distanced manner. Uh, but we do think we need a little bit more time given the timeline that we have from the guidance coming out last Friday to September 21st being only a few days away here, two weeks away. So we think if Section 6 were to proceed by buying a little bit more time, and then moving forward we'd be able to um, you know, be a little bit more prepared. I, I foresee Section 6 moving forward on fall sports. I do. Um, I, I think this is a good compromise that abides us a little bit more time as we try to reopen our schools and get kids into our building first. It buys my office a little bit more time to make sure that we have all of these communication plans are out to our, to our parents. Um, but it affords us the opportunity for our coaches to connect with our kids, which is our number one priority. Right? So even the sport of football, volleyball, and cheerleading, it still opens us up for the ability to even do, I'll call them, off-season, open gym style workouts, where it might only be a couple days a week, but that's okay because they're connecting with kids and, and keeping them active in some capacity. So the governor has approved the September 21 start for fall sports. As a section, I think it benefits us to be on the same page. So I, that is why the section is taking this survey. Um, does anyone have any objections to us responding to this survey with option three, well, knowing that there may be something else that, that may happen? It doesn't necessarily bind us. No. It's, it's simply a survey. It's not even a vote. They're just collecting data, but they wanted, they wanted districts to be aware of the conversations that were going on so they can be informed on the decision to move forward. So is Section 6 going to come out and make a decision then on what the date is? The make it so if, they make a, if the majority, let's just say, for example, choose option 1, will they then push that out as, and we will just follow what they say? We always have the autonomy to do what we deem appropriate. Um, so that would be a conversation that 
we would have to have at that time when they render their decision. But I think we would, uh, I mean, most likely we would follow it. I don't think that puts us in a very favorable position. Well, no, it doesn't put you in a, if we, it you in a tough position because if, you know, if teams are practicing from September 21 and we wait till September 28, we're, right. we're six days behind the eight ball on, on you know, practicing and getting ready for competition. Yeah. So to answer your question, Paul, yes, we would, after the section makes a decision, we'll follow it. Now is just our opportunity to put input into the decision. The only issue I foresee is that the one sport that doesn't have lights is golf. And they're not going to be able to finish the season if they start. I mean, they're already starting so late. Golf, have golf and tennis are two that will struggle. Um, Fortunately for golf, though, there are no practice requirements for golf. They're considered training, so they do not have to go 10 days. They could literally have a one-day tryout and compete the next day. Yeah, they were, I mean, I guess they don't have an official point yet, but I guess that was already, you know, the thought process. But um, I just wonder if there is some kind of hybrid thing where there could also be a spring there, I can tell you, I spoke to our, our league executive director today, and there was conversation about uh, boys golf taking place in the spring, which is actually the way that the state runs it. Um, the way that we run it in our league is boys play in the fall, and if they if they qualify for the state championship, they have to wait till the spring to play. So there's some flexibility there as well. I can bring that to the league to discuss. So there is a lot of discussion that needs to happen at the, the section level and the league level. They're asking for us to return this tomorrow by noon. So, um, you know, we didn't want to just, we wanted to inform the public and all of you. But our, at this point, we were leaning towards selecting option three, as long as there's no objection. Knowing that there's, you know, 78 districts that will be responding and the section will take that information. Does anyone have any objections? No. But there is some discussion that they can, they might move Sports. Um, they were talking about maybe moving football to the spring and baseball or softball to the fall now. Uh, so all of those decisions are still forthcoming. They're just gathering input. So thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Wheaton, for the Oh, yeah. I, question? I saw the reference in the paper to cross country field hockey and soccer playing the basketball. Yeah. So that question, we had a, I had a Zoom meeting today with Robert Zayas from New York State Public High School Athletics, and he answered that question. Um, the, the state DOH guidance document references all individuals should wear masks if they cannot maintain six feet or greater. For sports, the way that they reference it, I should read it direct here, but basically the way that he explained it was, if student athletes cannot tolerate a mask while playing or practicing, they do not have to. Even if they're not in distance. So the my, guidance my, is they wear a mask in practicing games. The guidance says they should wear a mask anytime six feet cannot be obtained. If they cannot tolerate a mask during physical activity because of physically exertion, if I'm thinking of sports soccer up and down the field all the time, wearing a mask might not be tolerable, then I don't have to. And who's the judge? What's the criteria? And my son is saying, your son, your your son said, uh, coach so and so, I can't. Coach Nunzio, I, I just, I don't feel comfortable wearing a mask. Coach is going to say, hey, you don't have to wear a mask. Yeah, because it's six feet, so I don't. Directly, yeah, directly from the, the DOH. Okay, thank you. Um, like everything with this pandemic, there's a lot of decisions to be made, uh, a lot of guidance to sit through and a lot of communication that needs to take place within our staff and also within our community. So thank you for all the work you've done so far and, and uh, I'm sure we'll have more information in the next couple of weeks. Thank you everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I wanted to give you a pre-opening update um, where we've been since the last time we met in July. Um, you, you've had the opportunity to see 
you've had the opportunity to see our physical buildings and all of the work that went into preparing them for the arrival of our students and staff. Um, and we've also had a lot of work that's been ongoing in the Office of Curriculum. And we had, today was our fourth superintendent's conference day, three last week and one today, in preparation for our students' arrival on Thursday. Tomorrow, as you may recall, is the orientation day for K-6 and 9, students in grades K-6 and 9. Um, Dr. Shanahan, if you'd like to join me, that would be great. So as you will recall, you know, our planning process included several committees. Um, the building-based ones focused on health and safety, while our social-emotional learning team focused on social-emotional well-being, and our teaching and learning team focused on professional development and teaching and learning. So within the building-based safety component teams, they focused on those five categories of PPE, screening, communication, training, physical distancing, hygiene. Um, there's been videos that have been produced for training kids in respiratory hygiene, hand hygiene, mask wearing, proper mask disposal, um, social distancing. You've seen the signage, all Amherst branded signage in our schools. Um, so we feel very comfortable um, to roll that out with our students when they return this week. Staff training started last week. Um, so the same categories, respiratory hygiene, hand hygiene, um, PPE, Mike, am I missing a couple? Screening. Screening and symptom checks, um, which again, we've had a chance to see here at the board meeting. Um, if you want to add just a couple items about the social emotional uh, committee and how that's rolling out with staff and students. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. I know Lynn has some stuff in her slide too, so she can jump in. But um, I think the whole plan was to ensure that those first few days, the first few weeks, hence tomorrow, with our kindergarten, sixth and ninth grade, to roll out. It's just, it's just time for kids, and not just kids, but staff, to settle in a bit. Um, so we focus on really more intense teaching and learning. Um, I think those days have been outstanding. The idea of folding in time, SEL time, so to speak, at every building and every grade throughout the day. So I know some principals talked a bit about it, like at the elementary level early on, but even at the secondary level, those home bases, we're going to be talking about um, things we can do with kids. And all our teachers have been armed with activities and resources to work with kids so that they can engage them, they can feel connected to school again. Um, and start their days off, well, not just their first few weeks, but every day moving forward, knowing that everything's different, everything's odd, they're not there with their friends, they're not there like a normal school day. Um, and then there, of course, are a number of resources for our staff. Um, I will say that we sent out a survey, not just, and many of you got it as parents, for students to see how they're doing. Our, our social emotional team, our social workers in particular, have already reached out to those families to check and see what supports need to be in place before the school year starts. Same thing happened for staff. So we had about a half dozen staff ask, ask for a little bit of help and guidance um, so that they received that. Um, we tried to do that before the start of school because we always want to be preventative and proactive so that when you start the school year, things are in place. Uh, and everyone feels, not just feels like they're in a good place, but also feels supported. Um, and that's what we want here, right? This, this is the Amherst family. Um, so those are some of the, the heavy hitters. We will also be doing another screening in the fall about a month in, it's referred to as SAVERS. Um, so, and that is part of our Fast Bridge program. So we screen kids on reading, writing, and math. But we didn't screen kids on social emotional learning and social emotional development. So we certainly did to some degree. Um, and our social workers were highly involved with that. But this provides a very consistent way in which to respond to those. And when we've lost some students along the way over the past couple of years, the point pushed hard with this is how can we better catch some of those kids? And considering we're in a pandemic, a better time to do that than now. So that'll happen uh, about a month in the school. We've already done some screening from through parents and the students. And then about a month in, after the kids sort of settle in, how are they doing now? Let's do a pretty touch base. And that'll also give the teachers time to learn about their students and get to know them, particularly if they're new. And then they'll be able to assess them and provide feedback to the DPS staff to see if they need to step in and provide more support. Yeah, so there was about a half-day professional development to get us started last week on the social-emotional turnkey training from our committees. Um, and, you know, as you all know, the morning meeting and the home-based check-in time will be, has been extended at all buildings 
to allow that ally program to be implemented. So there's a small group for each and for an adult um, to connect with kids. Can we do that there? So um, on top of reopening was first, right? The safety came first because we want to make sure that our faculty is concerned from that and they had a full understanding of how schools were going to operate. Then we moved into the social emotional across the days and then we went into instruction, trying to position instruction as important but making sure that those other pieces were in place. So we have an infrastructure um, that has a foundational base where we have two learning management systems that are different because of the developmental appropriateness of them. So last year we had all Google Classroom grades K through 12. So one of the problems with that is kids that are in kindergarten and first grade who can't communicate through keyboarding have a very difficult time working and then it puts extra work on families and parents, etc. Through Seesaw, Kids can communicate through audio recording their voice. It's very simple. We watched kids do it. It was amazing. They can respond through image and words, which your kindergarten kids, that's the normal mode to put those two different modalities together to communicate. It also has a direct connection to parents. So when students turn something in, the parents get an email. There's a way for parents and teachers to communicate directly in there. So we did um, purchase Seesaw as a learning management system for grades K through two with the option at third grade. Um, and most of our third grade teachers have stuck with Google Classroom, which developmentally makes sense, but you might see a Seesaw or two out there. Um, so our three through 12 is Google Classroom. So our learning management system are gonna be developmentally appropriate Seesaw in K through two-ish, a couple three in there, and then Google Classroom for three through 12. Uh, and then on top of that, the way that we can have a um, synchronous work with our students will be to couple that with a Zoom video platform, which will then be linked and embedded into either Google Classroom or Seesaw. So that's the infrastructure and bottom. We knew, your building principals work on this, if we could get our teachers confident in that platform before we got through these four days that we could start okay and we would be in good footing. Because one of the things that happens with digital tools is they're like shiny pennies. We could do that, or we could do that, or we could, no, rein it in, let's get really good at our foundational pieces, and then we're gonna keep layering and adding and adding as we go through to different applications. So that is our, the foundational base. And then these were the types of questions that teachers wanted answers to, and they kept asking us right before our opening day started. So at the elementary level, what do you need a social emotional check-in? With kids at home and kids in school, how am I going to do that? What does that look like? So we ran sessions with the teaching and learning committee at each level, got together the teachers and created some professional development for their colleagues, showing them what it would look like. So here I am in Zoom, how do I get my kids in? And I also have kids in front of me, what does that look like? So we operationalized that, the um, social emotional check-ins that are daily. Also, remember in the elementary, we have the hybrid teaching, but the remote Wednesdays are asynchronous. So they want to know what are our expectations, how does that work, what are we supposed to post, where are we supposed, all that information. So we went through those and answered those types of questions, modeling what that would look like, as well as our virtual teachers that are fully remote um, look a little bit different. So they needed some information. Um, and we also, by the way, added on um, extra professional development for our virtual academy because we wanted to make sure that they were shored up and ready to go. So they actually had an extra day on Friday and Monday to come in and work in getting their classrooms set up. Then for the middle and high school, um, their home base and homeroom, they wanted to go over the structure of what that would look like in a Google Classroom. And once again, the team led that. And then their model is a synchronous concurrent hybrid teaching model, which means right, the kids and the students are going to be at, at home are going to be in at the same time. Same thing, show, just show me, show me what that looks like. And so we did have um, some teams of teachers that run the Teaching and Learning Committee do some demonstrations. And then there's still lots of questions. So then after that, we left a lot of work time where they could actually play with Zoom. They, could, they got in and they started inviting each other. They started to look at what happens if we change our privacy settings. And so they started to work together in their adult teams to figure out how am I going to let six people in when I have six people in front of me? Oh, I have to make sure that I, they mute. If they don't mute, we're going to have feedback. Oh, or we need to have our headphones on. So all of those logistics they were going through and practicing in their teams 
um, or, or in their departments based on middle school or high school. Um, and we also talked about what expectations were around that remote Wednesday. What does that look like? We're still look like we're still going to do that check-in, um, but then what are we expected to do? What, where is the work supposed to be posted? Those types of things. So it was more of really changing our teaching into this digital space and not in an emergency this time. So if we want to be really good at this, what does it look like? And, and you're very, you know, I think our community is fortunate because we have a, have a lot of um, type A high achievers and a lot of it was just showing. And then it was like, oh, that's what it, okay, we can do that. And then they went and practiced. Um, the other thing is our instructional model is essential elements of instruction. And so um, our teachers wanted to say, how does that fit with this digital learning space? So we did have um, subcommittees work on that. So they actually took our instructional model, which I think is the strength of the district, is to have a common instructional model, and they talked about and showed what does this look like in a digital space. And that also um, reduced anxiety for people that are perfectionists, like, oh, you mean I still have an anticipatory set? Yeah, and this is how you might do it. This is a tool you can use to do it. We talked about synchronously, um, a lot of times the best time to use video is when you're modeling or giving information or input, right? That's what research says. So that would be a good time that you might want to record something. Why? Kids can go back and rewatch if they don't understand. They can rewind, rewind to specific points in time. So those were all um, kind of the what ifs questions that we were answering, answering throughout the different sessions over the days. Um, the other thing we did, and we tried to keep this to a minimum, we have got fantastic digital tools to grow into, um, but we did go over a couple high utility ones, because remember, our base is the infrastructure. If we can use our Google Docs, if we can use our form, if we can embed the video, all of that, we'll be okay. Um, but some teachers wanted to know, what happens if I want to like have kids annotate a PDF? What happens if I want them, what happens if I want to model something on a PDF and then open it up for them to write on? So Cami is a tool for middle, it goes K to 12, but middle school and high school really wanted to get their hands on that and play with that. So we did run a, a session on that. One way we're trying to increase what we did from the spring to now is we didn't do something called guided reading, which is instructional reading, which is taking kids at the level they're at and pushing them to the next level in a supported way. What we did do was a lot of independent reading because it was an emergency closure. Independent reading is excellent. Research says the number of minutes kids have eyes on text is directly proportional to their success as readers. So we knew if we got kids reading during this pandemic, we would at least be moving forward. But now we have time. So now we're saying that's not good enough, right? Not for Amherst, not for our students. So we're going to add in a guided reading component. In a print-based version, the teachers currently use literacy footprints and they have come out with a digital partner. That's their twin, right? So now we have ways to use those same books with kids in digital context. That'll take a couple weeks to launch, but the teachers are getting comfortable with that right now. We're getting everybody on board. But that's a way that we are upping the ante from what we did in the spring in an emergency closure, is we're gonna hit kids at their sweet spot in their instructional need and reading and move that forward. We're doing the same in math. In math, we made um, we had two other professional developments for um, elementary that went on. We purchased InSync. Our current math program is Eureka Math. And Eureka Math has a twin now called InSync. And it, it follows the same, um, the same sequence as their print-based version. So now the teachers can use InSync if we go fully remote, if we're hybrid, or let's say I teach something to my hybrid kids but I want them the next day to go watch a video to see it again. They can see it again before they do their practice. So what InSync has is video content, they can demonstrate all of the different concepts being taught. It has um, ways to, for kids to respond in PDFs, the little PDFs, which was important that we didn't have access to last year. So that is something that we did share with the elementary teachers over these days. And then the guidance is asking us to assess gaps. So we have got a lot of ways to do that um, for literacy already built in, and we felt like we needed um, to add something for math besides the formative assessments that we're already using. So EQUIP is a pre-module assessment that can be given before every um, Eureka module starts. And it takes the standards and it will, or the concepts that will lead to the meeting of the standards. And it will um, tell us if our, 
power kids are performing up and below, or above and below three grade levels. So the concept is measured if there are three grade levels below or above, we'll know, which means then we can differentiate our instruction to meet those students' needs. So those are some of the digital tools. There's a lot more, but we tried not to overwhelm, and we tried to get Google Classrooms up, get Seesaw Classrooms up, and um, get a couple of the high-utility digital tools out for our teachers. And most important, we're doing everything just turn around so quickly. We tried to message the fact that, I call it, um, sorry, a Penn Stater at heart, this is a grand experiment. Nobody has pushed the limits of the technology the way we are. Nobody has pushed it out in the time frame that we're doing it in. So we are going to get things, and we are going to have things that we're going to have to pivot and change. And we told them that, that it's important that we are here for you. If we need to change something, we'll change it. We need to have open lines of communication. We need to be flexible and problem solve. So we try to lead every day with that message with our teachers, with our building administrators, and our um, TAs and aides as well. That's a nutshell of what kind of went on across those days. How are they feeling about that? Good. They felt like it was more doable. I think it was. It's just overwhelming. We have people that are um, really high achievers. It's. It's. That's. And the main thing is getting that some of that, and they're feeling like it. So today seemed to be a productive day. We gave them today to just really get ready, you know, continue to get ready. And we try to do that all the way throughout the week. We teach you something, now go do it. Teach and go do it. And so today, um, yeah, it's just more logistics today. Well, um, given the circumstances, I yeah. think most people were around in yeah. the summer. Yeah. So prior to these days, we had we more and regular contact with teachers. I know each of the grade levels came and met at the elementary level several times over the last few weeks. You know, the departments in the middle of high school met. So leading up to these days, there was several meetings that normally wouldn't occur in a normal summer. Uh, so the stage was set really well. We also offered optional professional development for two weeks prior to these where people were compensated if they attended, but we offered um, so PD on um, teaching and learning in the digital environment, building relationships with kids. So there's been plenty of opportunities, but as Lynn had said, I think our goal is to be proficient with Zoom, be proficient with Google Classroom, because that gets you off the ground and allows you to, to teach and kids to learn. And then there's more layers to add on later on. And a lot of this stuff, you know, it seems overwhelming. But this was coming from the grassroots. You know, at, at Lynn's committee for teaching and learning, the teachers were saying, we want this, or we want to be able to do this. And so Lynn would find the tool or go out and get the license. Yeah, I knew about Seesaw. I was a little hesitant to put a new platform on the table because that can either be anxiety filling or they they have coming back. Would you please? Would you please? But yes. Yeah, we will do this. And, and they, um, our primary teachers feel like they can meet this um, their students' needs much better. There was a big sense of relief for them. Yeah, I think that's where the kudos really go to Lynn in terms of her ability to facilitate this process. You know, the as administrators or even as teachers, we all don't have the answers individually, but collaboratively you see what can be put together when people have the time and the opportunity to work together. So she's followed a, a great process and has been working around the clock. All of these folks have. This team is tremendous. I'm very proud of them and thankful for them. And like Lynn said, we're gonna have our bumps and bruises because everyone will because technology is what it is, but we feel like we're ready for Thursday. Thank you. <laughs> That's it for the September report. All right, we will need a motion for new business items. I'll make a motion for new business items C, 1, A through F, 2, A through D, 3, A through E, G, and H. We have a second. A second. Any discussion? All those in favor of new business items, E1A through F, 2A through D, 
3, A through E, G, and H. Please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. So I don't believe we have any follow up action yet. Okay. We will need then a motion to convene the executive session. I'll make a motion to convene to executive session for matters regarding the employment of a particular person. Second. Mr. Buell. All those in favor of convening to executive session, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Thank you, Patrick.